Thank you very much. Uh, it, it is a real pleasure to be back here. And uh, I, I was here several times in the 1990s helping to organize. I think actually the first time I ever came to Italy was a trip here in around 1986. And three things really uh, struck out, or three, I, I remember three things from that first trip. Um, one was <clears throat> getting to meet Abdus Salam, who wanted to know about all the latest developments in string theory. Um, the second was Italian pizza. And the third was um, going into a back room at the uh, Adriatico and being given an envelope with a million lira in it for expenses. These all created a, a very strong impression. Um, it's really nice to be back. So let me start by giving you a plan of the lectures. So the first two lectures, I'm going to start by giving you kind of an overview. Um, then I'm going to talk about what might be called classical moonshine. And uh, this involves some elements of what's called monstrous moonshine, um, a subject which was developed starting in the light, late 1970s through the 1980s and 1990s. So I'll talk about a particular construction of a conformal field theory due to Franco, Lepowski, and Merman that has the monster group uh, as a symmetry. I'll talk about what are called Mackay-Thompson series and their connection with called genus zero functions. Then I want to talk about something that I think is not um, perhaps so well known in the string theory community, which I've called deconstruction uh, and something called the Grice algebra. and things called Miyamoto involutions. Um, these are topics which appear in this conformal field theory, but which I think uh, might have some broader applications to conformal field theory and maybe to ADS through ADS-CFT. Um, I'll briefly mention uh, another example, classical example, Conway Moonshine and um, Briefly, perhaps talk about the construction of the CFT that has this Conway moonshine. So the third and fourth lectures, I'm going to talk about a more modern version of moonshine, which really started in 2010 and is continuing with the efforts of lots of people. And here I will tell you a little bit about Jacobi forms and their connection to the N equals two superconformal algebra. Um, I'll tell you about the result that uh, revitalized interest in moonshine, which is a result connecting the elliptic genus of a K3 surface with the Matthew group M24. And then I will tell you a little bit about umbral moonshine, which is an extension of this. And um, I'll talk about the relationship of this to meromorphic Jacobi forms. A little bit about something called the discriminant property. And most of this is going to be fairly mathematical. So in the sense that the title of my talk was uh, Moonshine in Physics, I will, towards the end and sprinkled throughout, try to talk about how this might connect to conformal field theory, string theory, uh, ADS, CFT, and things like that, but there will be a fair amount which is just um, mathematical.
So let me start by talking about one of the great theorems of 20th century mathematics, which is the classification of finite simple groups. So I assume you all know what a group is and that you all know what a finite group is. Finite groups don't play as big a role in particle physics uh, as continuous Lie groups, but they obviously show up in things like the study of crystals. And just to make sure that we're all on the same page, recall that a uh, normal subgroup N of a group G is a subgroup such that the left and right cosets are equal. And uh, that's written with this funny triangle symbol. And given a normal subgroup, you can put a group structure on the cosets to define the quotient G mod N, which allows you to decompose a group G into a smaller group H. And finite group theorists often use a notation, which I will borrow by writing G as N dot H, which means precisely this, that G has a normal subgroup N, and the quotient of G by that normal subgroup N is the group H. So there's a, a kind of analogy Simple groups are groups that have no normal subgroups, so they can't be decomposed into smaller groups. So you can kind of think of a finite simple group as being like a prime number in the sense that you can always decompose numbers into products of primes you can decompose finite simple groups into sort of products, not exactly products, but using a chain of normal subgroups into smaller and smaller groups. And so if you understand the finite simple groups, you understand finite groups in the same way that once you understand primes, you kind of understand all numbers. So the classification theorem is the statement that all finite simple groups are either in one of a set of infinite families of groups. And the first family is usually written by physicists like this. It's the uh, cyclic group with P prime. The alternating groups a n for n greater than or five, consisting of uh, permutations even, permutations of n objects. And then there are what are called simple groups of Lie type. And these come in families, which I'm not going to discuss in great detail. They're classical, exceptional, twisted. And basically what these involve are taking groups of Lie type that you, you know, Lie groups that you're familiar with and uh, writing them as groups over finite fields. So for example, we're all familiar with the group SL2, but you can take SL2, two by two matrix with determinants one over the group with seven elements, and that defines a finite simple group. Turns out to have order 168. And similarly, you can take symplectic groups, orthogonal groups, and there's even a way of doing this for exceptional groups, and there are various twistings of it, 
But essentially what you get are something like six or seven infinite families of finite simple groups where you look at you know, classical matrix groups over larger and larger matrices over fields with a finite number of elements. And then there are 26 sporadic groups which don't fit into any of these infinite families. And these 26 groups are sometimes usefully viewed as a group of 20 called the happy family. Finite group theorists like funny names. These are all subgroups of M, which is the monster group, which is the largest sporadic group. And then there are things called the pariahs, which are not subgroups of the monster group. There are six of them. These funny initials don't necessarily mean anything, but actually they're associated with names. So J stands for Janko, O for Onan, RU for Rudvalis, LY for Lions. And the groups in the happy family can be further usefully organized into a set of kind of generations. So the first generation, which were the first sporadic groups to be discovered, are the Matthew groups, M11, M12, M22, M23, M24. There's a second generation, all related to the leech lattice, which I'll talk about in a little bit. These are all groups which either um, arise from automorphisms of leech lattice or automorphisms of the leech lattice that fix some number of points in the leech lattice. So they're related to subgroups of a group called Conway Zero, which is the groups of automorphisms of the leech lattice. And they include other, so simple Conway groups, three of them. The Suzuki group, the Laughlin group, the Higman Siggs, Sig, Higman Siggs group, I think, and one of the Janko groups. And then there's a third generation consisting of some Fisher groups. Thompson group, Harada Norton, the Held group, the baby monster, and the monster. Now, so far I would have to say that this is a really bad introduction because all I've done is put a bunch of letters down without explaining what any of them are. All these funny names. This is the monster, this is the baby monster. So the reason that this is interesting is that this classification and this kind of structure just comes out of pure mathematics. But it seems that the best way of understanding many of these groups and many of their features, at least for those in the happy family, involves conformal field theory, string theory, string compactification on Calabi-Yau spaces. And that's very peculiar. So, in the string theory literature, I went through uh, the papers that I could find, and I may have missed one or two, but I looked at all the papers involving various aspects of moonshine, both from the old days and more recently. And in those papers, you will find a set of groups that are linked to the automorphism groups of particular superconformal field theories. So the monster 
is the automorphism group of a C equals 24 conformal field theory. The baby monster is the automorphism group of a conformal field theory with C equals 23 plus a half. And I'll tell you roughly how it's constructed. The Conway group is the automorphism group of a superconformal field theory with C equals 12. M23 and M22 are also automorphism groups of superconformal field theories that preserves an n equals 2 or an n equals 4 superconformal algebra. These are all kind of uh, classical examples. And uh, it turns out that in further pursuing moonshine, many of these other groups, like the Thomson group, the Suzuki group, the McLaughlin group, also show up. So in some way that I would say we really don't understand, the right framework for studying these sporadic groups seems to involve conformal field theory and aspects of string theory. And uh, that's kind of what I want to explain. I want to use techniques that come from conformal field theory to explain some of the structure, where these groups are coming from, what kind of things you can learn about these groups. And um, you know, the eventual goal, I think, here is not just to use string theory to learn about finite group theory, but rather to understand why it is that there's a connection between these sporadic groups, which are rather bizarre, exceptional, strange objects, and string theory. I mean, string theory is supposed to be a theory of quantum gravity. Why is it also a theory of so many of these sporadic groups? And um, I think there are two reasons to think that there might be uh, something to be learned. One is that although some of these theories, in terms of compactifications, are compactifications down to two dimensions. So for example, for a C equals 24 theory, you could use that to compactify the bosonic string or the heterotic string down to two dimensions, which doesn't seem very physical. But by ADS-CFT, we might learn something about three-dimensional gravity. And some of these other groups, like uh, M24, are connected to compactifications on K3 surfaces. And compactifications on K3 um, are kind of you know, everywhere in string theory. Um, both in string duality and in looking at string compactification on Calabi-Yau spaces. Many Calabi-Yau spaces are K3 fibrations. And so if you understand something about special about superconformal field theories related to K3, you understand something about more general kinds of string compactifications. So that's sort of my motivation. And um, I won't say, you know, I, I think it's enough justification to look at something that's rather uh, mathematical. All right, so the examples that I've described here are examples of what I would call classic moonshine. Classic in that they were first done um, you know, a number of years ago, and also in the sense that there is an explicit conformal field theory construction which realizes these symmetry groups. So in the constructions, the particular sporadic group of interest commutes with the Verasoro algebra. And so if we look at the partition function of the theory, and for the moment I'm just going to be focusing on the holomorphic part of the theory, then this is going to have a Q expansion the function of the parameter tau. So 
that labels the one-loop uh, partition function of the theory such that z of tau will be a modular form in general of some level, meaning some subgroup of the full modular group, and such that this coefficient c of n will be sums of dimensions of irreducible representations of sporadic group G that is a symmetry of the conformal field theory com commuting with Virasoro. That's since uh, you know, c to the n is counting the degeneracy of states at a given l naught eigenvalue that follows from the fact that the group commutes with the Virasoro algebra. So it's trivial, but what I'm about to say will put some meat on it. So it's sometimes, <clears throat> I think, said in the physics, um, in physics papers that moonshine is essentially some kind of connection between finite groups often chosen to be you know, interesting large groups, and modular forms but it's really more than that because if that's all it was it's trivial to make examples and the things that really deserve the name moonshine are more special than this. So for example Take any lattice L. You can make lattices with all sorts of interesting symmetry groups. You can just take a hexagonal limit lattice, which has a you know, hexagonal symmetry. But you can take very large lattices that have all sorts of interesting exotic symmetries. And you can consider string theory on RD mod L, if L has rank D. And this defines a C equals D conformal field theory, or in the math literature of VOA, with a symmetry which is the automorphism group of that lattice, and a partition function Z of tau, which will exhibit the symmetry. So in this way, you could exhibit moonshine in this sense for almost any group. And I think many of the sporadic groups, even the ones that are not part of the happy family, can be viewed as automorphism groups or subgroups of automorphism groups of large lattices. But moonshine requires more than this. It requires a certain rigidity. And that rigidity is usually connected with genus zero subgroups of SL2R. So you need also a kind of rigidity. And exactly what form this rigidity takes varies from case to case. But in the case of monstrous moonshine, and also in the Conway moonshine, This rigidity appears in the following way. If you have a symmetry group G and you have an element G in G that acts on the state space of the conformal field theory, then you can consider a twined version of the partition function where you take the trace of G in each eigenspace of L0 and these objects will be modular forms of 
or, well, in general, you would expect them to be subgroups of SL2Z because only certain uh, elements of SL2Z will leave this boundary condition fixed. But in fact, they often turn out to be modular forms for certain finite or discrete subgroups that are a little bit larger than SL2Z. So I'll just say subgroups of SO2R. And in the case of Monstrous and Conway Moonshine, these are all genus zero subgroups. So, sorry? Discrete, sorry, yeah, discrete subgroups. But I was just about to say that. Yes. Yes, they're weight zero. The partition function is weight zero, and these twine versions of them uh, are also weight zero. All right, so what, what do I mean by genus zero? Well, let's recall from string theory that the fundamental domain for the modular group is the following region bounded by, so this is the tau plane, so bounded by these lines at the real part of tau is equal to a half and minus a half, and lying above the semicircle tau equals one. So in other words, under elements of SL2Z, Any point in the upper half plane can be mapped to this fundamental domain F. And uh, if you want to be a little more precise, you should actually include this part of the boundary because this is mapped to this by tau goes to tau plus one, and this is mapped to this region by tau goes to minus one over tau. So this is a fundamental domain and its boundary. And you can take this fundamental domain, and what does it look like? It looks kind of like this. It has these cusp points here because they're elements of order three that leave these point fixed. There's kind of a cusp off at infinity. And you can map this fundamental domain by a function, which is usually called J of tau, to the Riemann sphere. So in other words, as tau varies over this fundamental domain, there's a complex function, j of tau, which maps this fundamental domain one to one onto points on the Riemann sphere. So whenever you have this situation, h being the upper half plane with coordinate tau, and you have some subgroup, which I'll call, let's say, gamma g, uh, of SL2R, which acts on the upper half plane. And whenever there's a function, Tg, which maps this to the Riemann sphere, then you say that gamma G is a genus zero subgroup. And the function Tg of tau is called the help module for that group.
Now, these genus zero subgroups are um, kind of special. There are many, many subgroups which are not genus zero. Um, and some examples will come up later. So if you consider gamma dot n, which consists of elements of the modular group, such that C is congruent to zero mod n, then this is genus zero, or n is equal to two, three, four, up to 10, and then 12, 13, 16, 18, and 25, if memory serves me right, um, but for no other values of n. So going back to Zohar's question, it's absolutely true that if you take the coefficients c of n, you can always decompose them into trivial sums of a trivial representation, or you can decompose them into different ways. But this condition that, first of all, this be modular, and in some cases that it be modular and be a genus zero subgroup, is extremely constraining and non-trivial, and will fix what the decompositions are in general. And is also what makes moonshine more than just a connection between modular forms and finite groups. It really um, turns it into something that's rather special. Sorry? Mm -hmm. Sorry? Yeah, uh, yes. I guess so, yes. I mean, I'm not sure what is the question of terminology or? Um, I've seen this terminology used, but I'm not 100% sure what it means. So I, I, I'm not sure I should uh, say anything. But I can. But it is true that if gamma g is a discrete subgroup of SL2R, I can take the quotient of the upper half plane by this group. And this will define a two-dimensional surface, which can have genus 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera, depending on the exact form of the group. So I mean, I think that's the. A, correct statement, and the, the particular cases that arise in, uh, in moonshine are genus zero. Now, um, So I'm going to, I will, I will spell out some of the details of this, because I know this has been very broad brush. But I just wanted to say, I mean, still as kind of part of the overview, that these examples, which I'll talk about in more detail, are the examples of classical moonshine, where there is a CFT. But the more modern versions of moonshine involve different structures which are less well understood. So in particular, they involve mock modular forms, which I will define for you. Rather than modular forms.
They involve groups which are related to Niemeyer lattices, which I will say more about in a moment. And there is a connection, which I would say is not perfectly understood, to K3 surfaces. And maybe to more general Calabi-Yau manifolds. So for this more modern kind of moonshine, there is no general explicit CFT, vertex operator algebra, string theory, background, whatever you want to call it, construction. There are hints of connections to black hole GPS state counting, which I'll mention when we get there. And there are also some hints of relations between the classical and modern moonshine. But the whole situation is murky because the hints are just that, they're not direct connections. And um, because we don't have an explicit construction, there are a lot of results that, that uh, can be derived without complete understanding. So, all right, so that's kind of what I would like to tell you about. First, starting with the uh, classical moonshine. And we'll start with a discussion of monstrous moonshine. from a conformal field theory and string theory point of view. So we can think about this in terms of a compactification of the bosonic string. So you know that if we compactify the bosonic string on a d-dimensional torus, there is a Narain moduli space of compactifications which has the form of a double coset And you move around in this moduli space by varying the constant metric and two form fields on the torus. And the general point in Narain moduli space is, you know, not a complicated, but it's not a rational conformal field theory in that you have an infinite number of. Uh, terms in the partition function, it doesn't holomorphically factorize in terms of some finite number of characters of some larger algebra. But we can go to special points and one of those special points arises when d is equal to 24 where we can take the even self-dual lattice of momenta to simply be the direct sum where lambda is an even self-dual rank 24 lattice. 
So this situation um, generalizes a construction which shows up often in string theory. That is, if you want to have an even self-dual lattice, then that only occurs when d is a multiple of 8. And when d is equal to 8, the unique answer is the E8 root lattice. When d is equal to 16, you can have the E8 E8 root lattice, or you can have a weight lattice of spin 32 mod Z2. Those, of course, are the gauge groups of the heterotic string. And then in 24 dimensions, there's the Leach lattice. And there are 23 other lattices called Niemeyer lattices. These Niemeyer lattices are not, uh, well, they play various roles, but uh, let me say just a bit about them because they will show up later when we talk about umbral moonshine. So they are, they are constructed starting from a root lattice of A, D, or E type, meaning you take sums of root lattices of AN, DN, or E6, E7, and E8. Yes? Could you speak up? I No, no, it's no, no, this is purely a spatial compactification. So I'm assuming that time and one of the spatial dimensions are non compact. So if you take an ADE, sum of ADE root lattices with total rank 24 such that each component has equal Coxeter number. And what is the Coxeter number? Well, if you have the root lattice, let's say, so here's the root lattice of uh, SU3. There are always, um, vial reflections where you reflect in the hyperplane that is orthogonal to the root. And for any root lattice, there is a group, an element of the group of such reflections called the Coxeter element, which is the product over the simple roots, just the positive simple roots of these vial reflections. And the order of that element is called the Coxeter number. So I can give you a little um, table of what these are. So for a m minus one, the answer is m. So in particular for A1, which is SU2, um, it's, the order is two, there's just a single reflection. For A2, which is SU3, the order is three, corresponding to the threefold symmetry of that uh, lattice. For D1 plus M over two, so for the orthogonal groups, the answer is M. And for E6, E7, and E8, 
The answer is 12, 18, and 30. So here's a little exercise. Using what I've just provided you, classify the root systems x that have rank 24 and equal coxeter number. Um, and you'll find that there are 23 examples. A1 to the 24th is obviously rank 24, and all the components have the same coxeter number. A2 to the 12th is another example. Then there turn out to be more complicated things like A11, D7, E6, which also has rank 24, and using that table has equal coxeter number. And then this continues, and you get things like E6 to the 4th and E8 cubed. All right, so these things will appear later. But for right now, I want to consider a compactification where we don't choose any of these, but we choose the leech lattice. So we'll choose for our compactification the leech lattice, which is the unique even self dual rank 24 lattice. with no roots, meaning that the set of elements in the Leech lattice with length squared 2, with the usual normalization, is uh, the empty set. There are no points of length squared 2. Instead, the shortest vectors have length squared 4. Yes? For which classification? Well, in the, um, I haven't really told you why um, the Niemeyer lattices only involve ADE, but it's just a statement. I mean, for, for B and C, um, there's certainly a coxeter number, there's a coxeter element, but they're not, they have roots of different length, so they're not simply laced, and for reasons that I think would involve much more detail, you can't use them to construct even self-dual lattices in this way. Is it possible? Sorry, say that again? By vile reflection in what? I'm really, so I'm, I'm really considering compactifications um, where I have a 24 dimensional torus and then either R11 or if you want to work in Euclidean signature R2. But everything that I'm talking about, all the vile reflections, are occurring in this 24 dimensional spatial part of the compactification. And I really haven't assumed or said anything about what's happening in the remaining two non compact dimensions. So, um, you know, you can work in Minkowski or Euclidean signature sort of as you please, and the vial reflections don't act here at all. Um, you could consider compactifications down to you know, one or zero dimensions where you try to compactify this part as well. That gets into all sorts of kind of complicated and subtle issues which are not relevant for what I'm discussing. And I, I wouldn't, you know, I don't necessarily have to talk about this in the context of string theory, but um, I could just talk about C equals 24 conformal field theories. But 
I think there are a few useful things to be said when you think about it in terms of string theory compactification, so that's why I'm doing that. All right, so for the theory that's related to monstrous moonshine, we pick the leech lattice. And the partition function of this theory then completely factorizes into the theta function of the Leech, Leech lattice divided by eta to the 24th where the theta function of the Leech lattice is a sum over elements of the Leech lattice q to the lambda squared over 2. And from now on, we can focus just on the holomorphic degrees of freedom. And once we do that, we can then decide what we want to do with the anti-holomorphic degrees of freedom. We can do something to them. We can consider boundary conditions to define d-brains, et cetera, et cetera. But um, the construction that I want to talk about just involves the holomorphic part, and that's a legitimate thing to do since we've cho chosen a point in the rain moduli space where the theory factorizes into purely into a holomorphic and an anti-holomorphic part. All right, so let me um, first of all tell you what the construction of Frankel and Lepowski and Merman involves in terms of conformal field theory language. So if we look at the states in the CFT that we've just described, defined by string theory on the Leech lattice, and we look at the holomorphic part, there are states which are Fox space ground states. I have 24 free bosons, so I have 24 oscillators which annihilate the ground state. The zero mode I'll call P hat I. And I build up a Fox space from this ground state in the usual way by acting with the creation operators. And clearly, the partition function of this theory as a contribution from the vacuum. It has a contribution from the first excited state, of which there are 24. And then this factor of 196884 comes from states alpha minus 2, alpha minus 1i, alpha minus 1j, and states on the Leech lattice that have length squared equal to four. 
So there are 24 states here. There are 24 times 25 over 2 here. And there are 196560 states here. And if you add up these three numbers, you'll get 196884. So This partition, the partition function of this theory is equal to the J function up to a constant, and it is a weight zero modular function which is the Haupt module, or a Haupt module, for the modular group. And it's unique given the constant term and the fact that it starts with Q inverse. And it was famously uh, noticed by John Mackay that 196884 is equal to 196883 plus 1. And this is a sum of the dimensions of the first two irreducible representations of the monster sporadic group, at least where you order them by their size. And um, this was regarded as, you know, being so shocking and astonishing at the time because at the time there was, wasn't an understanding that you naturally get weight zero modular forms in conformal field theory. So 24, however, is not the dimension of anything other than 24 copies of the one-dimensional representation, so that looks a little bit odd. And what Frank Lepowski and Merman figured out how to do was to um, take this theory and modify it to get rid of that term and to give you a theory that has the monster group as its automorphism group. So I want to tell you what the modification is. And in the next lecture, I'll tell you some things about um, how you can see that the monster is the automorphism group, but I'm not going to be able to give you a full explanation because that's a rather long involved story. But I'll try to tell you about some useful things that you can do using the conformal field theory point of view. So what Frankel, Lepowski, and Merman proposed to do was to consider a asymmetric Z2 orbifold of this theory, where you take the holomorphic part of the left moving coordinates and do an orbifold by a minus one action. So the partition function of their theory, as usual, is going to be trace in the untwisted Hilbert space that we've just constructed of the projection operator onto G invariant states. Maybe I shouldn't call this G. Let me call it theta so I don't confuse it with elements of the monster. And then in order to have modular invariants, we know in orbital folds we have to include a twisted Hilbert space. And in that Hilbert, twisted Hilbert space, we also have to project onto invariant states. And this, it will turn out, is equal to J of tau with no constant term. and with the monster group as its automorphism group. So by automorphism group, I really mean 
that there's a symmetry of the theory which would preserve OPEs, correlation functions, et cetera, the full structure of the conformal field theory. Sorry? Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, well, let me, so I'll tell you briefly what this involves. So what happens when we do the Z2 orbifold? Well, first of all, we project onto the invariant states. So if I look over here, these states have eigenvalue minus one under the Z2 action, so they will disappear. These states have eigenvalue minus one. These have plus one. Of these states, well, I'll have to construct linear combinations which have eigenvalue plus or minus one under the orbifold action. So it's not too hard to see that this part of the theory simply gives a contribution which is one half theta leech over to the 24th, which is just one half of one. And then the action of theta, well, theta takes states with momentum lambda to those with momentum minus lambda, so they don't contribute to the trace. So the only things contributing to the trace here are the oscillator states. And because they have eigenvalue minus one under the action of theta, I get a one plus q to the n rather than a one minus q to the n from the trace of theta. And then we need to compute what the trace is in the twisted sector. And in the twisted sector, we have boundary conditions that xi has to come back to itself up to a minus sign. And normally this would mean that the ground state is labeled by the fixed points. But in an asymmetric orbifold, that's not the right answer. Modular invariance requires the, the a to go from one to the square root of the number of fixed points. If you were to think of this as a symmetric transformation, and I'll say a bit more in a minute about why that's the case. So actually, A goes from 1 up to 2 to the 12th rather than 2 to the 24. And given that, you can then compute the contribution to the partition function in the twisted sector. So there's a 2 to the 12th from this ground state degeneracy. There's a Q to the half. And this a half is minus one plus three halves. This three halves is 24 over 16. And that's using the fact that the twist field for a single boson has dimension 16 and we're twisting 24 of them. And then in the twisted sector, I have half intergermoted oscillators. And then I have to include the projection on them. So if you um, add these up to compute the total partition function, You can write it in terms of the usual Jacobi theta, theta functions. And you can show
that it has precisely effect of killing the 24 and leaving everything else as it was before. Now, this more or less had to work because as long as the orbital fold uh, satisfies level matching, so preserves modular invariance, you had to get a weight zero modular form here. The tachyon survives, so this has to start as q to the minus one. So the only thing that's undetermined, given that it's modular invariant, is the constant term. And the constant term is clearly zero because you kill the states that contributed to it. And in the twisted sector, um, the, all the states are massive because the dimension of the twist field is three halves. So this form follows just from the fact that this twist preserves modular invariance. What time did I start? 10.30? Okay, I guess that means I'm done with this lecture, but um, I'll just, I, I guess I'm giving another one soon. So um, I just want to tell you a little bit about what we're going to do. It turns out, um, well, so one thing we would like to do is to see some evidence that this theory actually has the monsters at symmetry group. I'm not going to be able to show you that in detail, but I do want to show you how a number of aspects of the group structure of the monster are evident in this orbital fold construction. And then I want to tell you about uh, an interesting construction that constructs a kind of uh, an algebra that was connected with the monster before this conformal field theory understanding and that I think has more general application. And I want to also show you how the baby monster can be extracted from this using a t technique which really um, follows just from the structure of conformal field theory. So we'll do those three things this afternoon. <laughs>